Hello everybody, my name is Shankarji. Now we'll be discussing chapter 11, New Empires and Kingdoms. Because the earlier kingdoms and empires, they collapsed and new kingdoms replaced them. So we are going to study more about them. So let's take a look at Prashastis. It's an important term, Prashastis and what they tell us. Uh, these inscriptions were made mainly on uh, stones or wood, mainly on stones or rocks. So Prashastis are special in inscriptions in praise of a king, object, deity, etc. Mostly, Prashastis were in praise of a king. These became famous during the Gupta dynasty because after the Maurya dynasty and after Kanishka the Kushans, the Gupta dynasty came into power. The Gupta period, the Gupta dynasty is also known as the Golden Age because lots of uh, fine arts developed during this period. King Samudra Gupta was a great Gupta ruler during this period. His poet Hari Shena composed a lot of prashastis to honor King Samudra Gupta around about 1700 years ago. Samudra Gupta was a great Gupta ruler. We'll take a look at uh, Samudra Gupta's prashasti. What poet uh, Hari Shena wrote about King Samudra Gupta in his uh, Samudra Gupta's prashasti. The poet Hari Shena praises uh, the King Samudra Gupta brilliantly as a great warrior, as a great scholar and a great human being as well. The king was uh, almost treated as equal to gods, like uh, they were given like a demigod status. So the prashastis was composed in very long sentences, like they had to be long, like the, the great king Samudra Gupta, like lot of adjectives, lot of uh, adverbs as well, to emphasize the praise of the king in concern. Now we'll take a look at genealogies, because as you mentioned the prashastis, like you mentioned not only the praise of the king, you also mentioned their ancestors. So in one way, we can learn a lot about the ancestors of various kings uh, by studying their prashastis accordingly. So it was very convenient for, our, uh, for historians to study them. Now we'll take a look at King Harshavardhana and the Harsha Charita. King Harshavardhana was a great king who ruled North India, the Gangetic Plains, the plains where the Ganga River flows, very fertile area, the Magadha and Bengal. So Harshavardhana ruled these areas around 1400 years ago. Banabhatta, his court poet, wrote his biography, the Harsha Charita in Sanskrit, which gives a lot of uh, detailed account of Harshavardhana and his life during his uh, kingdom. So the great Chinese pilgrim Huang Zhang also spent a lot of time in his court and accounted the details. Then we'll take a look at the Pallavas, Chalukyas and Pulakeshans Prashasti. So the Pallavas, they had their uh, capital in Kanchipuram and their empire, their kingdom was surrounded in the region around Kanchipuram and modern day Chennai, those areas or Mamallapuram or Mahabalipuram, nowadays it's known as Mamallapuram. So there's a very famous uh, rock inscription in Mamallapuram as well, which uh, historians study regularly and learn a lot about uh, the Pallava Empire and even a lot of uh, tourists uh, visit uh, those inscriptions regularly. Mamallapuram is a great site for historians and also for tourists as well. The Pallavas uh, had their capital in Kanchipuram. Uh, they were really very uh, great in doing uh, rock inscriptions. They were uh, expert in uh, uh, rock art and rock inscriptions as well. So their arch enemies were the Chalukyas. The Chalukyas had their, uh, their region around the Raichur Doab, which is in Andhra Pradesh, modern day Andhra Pradesh, between the Krishna rivers and the Tungabhadra. So they had the capital at Aihole. Aihole was the capital, which was not only an important trading center, but it was also a great religious center as well. They fought with each other a lot, the Pallavas and the Chalukyas. Uh, one of the famous uh, Chalukya king was Pulakesin II. His court poet uh, Ravi Kirti composed his prashasti. Pulakesin II was a great, uh, powerful and strong ruler uh, and all of his enemies uh, feared him a lot and they were really on their uh, uh, very best to defend against him. The Pallava uh, kingdoms and the Chalukya kingdoms, even though they flourished, it was quite short lived and later uh, the Rashtrakutas and the Chola dynasties came to power and they replaced the Pallavas and the Chalukyas. We'll uh, take a look at how were these kingdoms administered. Mainly land revenue was collected because the land tax in the form of revenue was collected and was given to the kings to maintain the uh, various aspects of the uh, kingdom and the uh, empire. Important administrative posts were hereditary. Like say for example, uh, if a person held a post of a general in the king's army, after his death his son was given the same post. 
So in this way, the kings were able to earn the trust and respect of the people whom they governed. And then one person held many offices. Important men influenced major decisions in administration as well. So these were some of the uh, salient features of the kingdoms which were administered during those periods. A new kind of army was developed. The kings maintained a well-organized army with elephants, chariots, cavalry, means the horsepower, the, the knights with horses, and foot soldiers. They also took help from various military leaders called Samantas, who, who provided the king with troops whenever the kings required extra troops. How the Samantas maintained their uh, troops? They collected land revenue to maintain troops. They were given freedom to collect land revenue from the local people so that they can maintain their troops. Uh, for the kings uh, whenever they required the extra troops. However, when the kings were weak, the Samantas tried to break away from the kings and they tried to become independent. Uh, it was a tough time for the kings managing the Samantas, also known as the military leaders, efficiently. In this way, both the kings and uh, the military leaders called Samantas worked with each other. And then we'll take a look at assemblies in the southern kingdoms. The Pallavas inscriptions mention a number of local assemblies. For example, the Sabha of Brahmin landowners. Because the Brahmin landowners, they had the land and they also took part in the administration. The term Ur was a village where landowners were not Brahmins. They were different landowners, but they were not Brahmins. So those place was known as Ur. Then the term Nagaram meant it was an organization or an area of merchants. The merchants who traded in various businesses. Then we'll take a look at ordinary people in the kingdoms. Kalidasa was a great poet. He wrote his great, his great uh, composition known as Abhinyana Shakuntalam. It described uh, the love between King Dushyanta and a young woman called Shakuntala. It's a very uh, great emotional uh, composition written by the great uh, poet Kalidasa during this time. And then uh, the kings and Brahmins mainly spoke Sanskrit in the Sanskrit language and others spoke in Prakrit. And uh, there were also one uh, other group of people who did all the uh, tough and dirty work. I would say the maintenance work. They were known as the untouchables. And so these uh, people had to do the low menial jobs like cleaning the gutters and sewages like that. These kind of people lived in the, in the kingdoms. Uh, the kings, the Brahmins, uh, mainly the traders and the untouchables. So we took a look at uh, all these various aspects like prashastis, various kingdoms and the type of administration and the type of people living in their kingdoms. Uh, while these new empires and kingdoms were being developed in India, far away in Arabia, same time, 1400 years ago, Prophet Muhammad uh, preached and founded a new way of life known as Islam. Islam is a religion based on uh, humanity. His main teachings were that all, all people should be treated equal, uh, follow humanity, like give charity, help each other. But at the same time, he also uh, preached uh, to fight, fight for justice. Uh, he summarized a lot of rituals, he simplified rituals, and he founded uh, Islam based, mainly based on humanity. This was happening elsewhere while uh, new empires and kingdoms were being developed in India. So now we'll take a look at some important dates. Beginning of the Gupta dynasty took place approximately 1700 years ago and uh, the rule of Harshavardhana was about 1400 years ago. So these are some of the important dates to be remembered in this chapter. Do a lot of further research if you want you can add further points to the existing knowledge and if you have any doubts or suggestions please let us know in the comment section below. Thank you so much. Have a great day.